Welcome everyone to this latest episode of Journalists in Chairs Drinking Wine. I'm delighted to have with us uh, this afternoon, uh, this morning for her, Maria Cheng. Maria is the Associated Press's medical writer based in London. Maria, thanks so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Jeff. Uh, well, you know, this is this is the first time we, we've ever done this kind of remote interview uh, here, <laughs> <laughs> so fingers crossed it works. But I just want to say it's it's absolutely delightful to see you. Um, I mean, I, I was uh, lucky enough to to see you over the summer in London, and you know, when we were planning this uh, this this interview, you know, I, I I thought you know I don't know when the next time I'm going to actually see you in person, and. Um, that is really, really depressing. Uh, but at least it's, it's, it's good to, to see you here. Um, and what, I, what I've done is, because this is an episode of Journalists in Chairs Drinking Wine, uh, we have to have some form of wine. Uh, however, it's difficult to drink wine when you know, you're, what, several thousand miles away. Um, so what I've done here is I've got a, a full bottle of, of, um, uh, of, of Clicquot uh, Champagne, which is uh, not the most expensive champagne in the world, uh, but it is, it is a, a really good champagne uh, and it's got a good backstory to it as well as I'm sure you know uh, it was it was the founded by, by yes. sorry the widow Clicquot the widow Clicquot Veuve is, is widow in French and and she was uh, after her husband died she was the one that actually made the, the winery a success by uh, in the early 18th uh, early 19th century um, finding the uh, the key way of producing modern champagne. Uh, so it's, it's, a really, it's a really neat story. She was a single mother, um, did all this on her own. And this is back in the 19th century. So it's kind of a cool story there. It's also a damn good champagne. And uh, I'm going to save this bottle. I'm not going to open it. And we will uh, drink it or drink a replacement when, uh, when I next see you. So that's, that's, my, promise. that's my promise to you. Um, I can't anyway. wait. <laughs> I know, me too, me too. So um, I, I guess my first question is, you know, you're, you're reporting on, on COVID-19 uh, in Europe. You're also trying to report this story under lockdown. I mean, how, how are you managing to, to do this? Um, well, I mean, luckily I'm a text reporter, um, so I don't have to be out there in the hospitals um, seeing what's happening there. Obviously, we'd be better if, if we could be, um, but unfortunately, that's just not the situation we're in right now. Um, so, I mean, for me, I'm, I'm covering a lot of the kind of public health angles of the story. So, you know, remotely dialing into, you know, WHO, the World Health Organization, does these remote press conferences every other day. Um, there's a daily press conference in the UK, and it's all handled by Zoom right now. So, you know, the same sort of breathing right now. Wow. Um, and, you know, a lot of the scientists that I talk to, I would normally talk to them over the phone. You know, I'm talking to people all over the world, elsewhere in the UK, elsewhere in Europe. So in, in some ways, it doesn't matter a whole lot. But, of course, it would be nice to be able to get out there to some of the hospitals here in the UK for some of the local stories that I'm doing. But... It's just not possible, unfortunately. So you can't go to the hospitals yourself. You can't go to these venues. Uh, and, and I imagine the people at, at hospitals you want to talk to to get information are going to be incredibly busy. I mean, how are you getting information from these places that you can't physically visit anymore? Well, it's a lot of harassment by phone. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, well, I, I know you're quite good at that. That is one of, your, one of your key skills as a journalist. I remember that. Yeah. Well, you know, I think any journalist is, is, has to develop pretty thick skin and, you know, people ignore your calls, your emails, just call again, email them again, <laughs> call them every half hour if you have to. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, the people that I really want to talk to are incredibly busy right now. They are either treating patients or they're participating in teleconferences with WHO and other national authorities to figure out, you know, some of the pressing questions about the virus. But I think they also realize that it's also important to talk to the press because as I'm sure you and your students know, there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's just a you know, tsunami of information about um, COVID-19, some of it correct, some of it not correct. Um, so I think they also want to prioritize some of their time to, to the press to making sure what they think is the right message, the correct scientific information is getting out. So it's, it's not impossible. 
Yeah, well, that's a good point. And we, we've spent in this class a lot of time on, on uh, news, uh, uh, social media verification uh, and, and working on news literacy and, 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 and debunking rumors. I mean, do, do you think now it's more difficult to be a journalist, particularly in the, in the medical field, with social media and so many of these crazy conspiracy theories flowing around? D does, it, does it make your work harder? Do you find yourself having to constantly debunk these things for your readers? Well, I mean, we, AP has started, um, you know, a regular fact check uh, series that what we did even before the pandemic started, which addresses some of the more prevalent conspiracy theories. I mean, we ran one just the other day on this idea that the 5G network is somehow connected to coronavirus. Um, so, I mean, yes, we are having to address some of these things. Um, but there's just an overwhelming amount of it. And I, I think we have to kind of carefully pick which ones we are going to address and give, you know, even more publicity to. I think that's a constant struggle. Do you want to address this? Right. Do you want to say that this is legitimate um, because it risks giving it a little bit of credibility if we decide to cover it? But at the same time, if it is gaining currency and it's clearly inaccurate, um, and potentially dangerous information, then it probably is something that we should address. Yep, 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 certainly, certainly. Now, when we were talking earlier, uh, you mentioned that you know, COVID-19, coronavirus, that's the story now. And because of it, we've also seen entertainment venues close, there are no sporting events. And you mentioned now that suddenly you, all your colleagues who used to cover entertainment and sports have been assigned to the coronavirus and the COVID-19 story. I mean, what's, what's that been like? I mean, is it, has it been nice to have all your colleagues finally understand what you do? Or is it a pain in the ass because they're, they're now on, oh. intruding on your beat? I love my colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you do. Um. <laughs> Um, it is, it's a strange time. I mean, I've never seen any news story so completely, overwhelmingly take over the entire news media like this. I mean, even after Donald Trump was elected in the U.S. and there was this overwhelming attention on politics in the United States, I've never seen anything like this where every single department of the AP, you know, news, photos, radio, TV, sports, entertainment, religion, everybody is writing about the pandemic. Um, and, you know, once the sports and entertainment, all their events, all the football matches, all the concerts, everything got canceled, they, you know, AP sort of redeployed these people to coronavirus stories. So it is a bit unnerving in some ways, I've, you know, to have one singular story like this. But then on the other hand, there's so many different strands to the story you know, for everybody mm. to cover. You know, there's economic implications, you know, the price of oil going negative, <laughs> linked to coronavirus, um, you know, entertainment stories, you know, like the uh, the concert the other day that was organized by WHO. Um, I, there are just so many different angles to the story that there isn't more than enough for everybody to cover, but it is a bit strange that everybody is suddenly becoming an epidemiologist and has thoughts on what the incubation period might be like or if asymptomatic people are transmitting the virus. It is admittedly weird to have everybody converging on, on the health beat like this. So what are you kind of carving out as your area? Is there one particular area of coverage that, that you're looking at? What's your main focus right, right now? Uh, it's a good question. <laughs> I think the answer varies every day. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess, uh, you know, from from my perspective, I'm interested in the kind of public health response and accountability questions. Um, I wrote a story a few weeks ago about why it was that European hospitals, which are typically rated the world's best, have been having such a hard time in this outbreak. They're just not geared to deal with a public health crisis like this. Um, and, you know, I think some of the scientific questions are being handled very well by my colleagues in the U.S. Um, and I'm kind of more interested in you know, the public health response, what we knew at what time, if the right measures were taken, um, and, you know, kind of trying to parse that out is, is a bit challenging. Um, but, I mean, my colleagues in Italy and Spain have been doing amazing work in the hospitals telling the story from the front lines. So, obviously, it's a bit difficult for me to do that. Uh, you know, the U.K. is a slightly different outbreak. Um so I, I think trying to do something slightly different, maybe taking a step back and looking at the public health response 
more broadly is is what I would say I you know I'm trying to focus on. Yeah, you know, one of the challenges too, it, it seems to me, and we've talked about this in class, is is data. I mean, to to really evaluate what's going on, you need data. You need data on on the number of confirmed cases. You need to try to find out how many people are infected. But you know, there's there are different standards of of data out there. Different countries, you know, account confirmed cases in different ways. I mean, how do you use data in your stories, or, or how do you use data in your reporting to, to try to get a handle on the real situation? Are there different metrics you use? Um, I think, as you said, the numbers are variable from country to country because everybody is using slightly different definitions. Like the UK, when it announces its daily number of people who died, that is a count that may include deaths from several days back. So that doesn't oh. always equate with what other countries are doing. So I think for me, it's, it's more useful to look at the, the trend. Um, you know, is the epidemic curve actually flattening? Is it coming down? Is that sustainable? Um, I, I think that's more reliable measure than kind of the day-to-day -day figures, which, which we know are bad. I mean, and, and testing is a great example because testing just depends on how much a country is doing. So Germany, for example, is, is doing amazing on testing, as you might expect. Um, so they have very high numbers because they're testing very widely. And the UK's numbers are, are not very good by comparison. So in some ways, it's not fair to compare that. Um, but I think you have to take into consideration what goes into these definitions and what does it tell you about the epidemic? Does it really say anything or does it just tell you how bad they are at testing? For yeah, I mean, and I think that's one frustration too, because you know we're all trying to quantify what's going on, and we want some certainty in, in all this confusion and and um, you know misunderstanding and all the unknowns. But you know we can't cling to the, the data, and as you said, you know the day-to-day the -day figures, which sadly I, I, I follow, you know are, are misleading. Um, I mean, are there ways you try to remind your your readers don't pay too much attention to the data day-to-day -day figures? Look at the trend. I mean, it's something definitely that we at the AP are, are talking about a lot um, among our, you know, my editors and, and in our daily news meetings. I mean, I think for the first few weeks in the outbreak, we were pushing out news alerts that said, you know, this is the daily number of cases in Spain and Italy, and Italy has overtaken, you know, China with the most number of deaths or whatever, like something like that. But we have tried to shift away from that because it's not very useful information to readers anymore. Um, so. I think in every story we try to include an explanation that these numbers are very imperfect at the moment and, and try to talk to an expert about what it means. I mean, is it slowing down? Um, is this just a momentary lapse? I mean, you know, even we know, for example, after a weekend, you're not going to see an increased case count usually until Tuesday because reports over the weekend don't tend to happen very regularly. So right, we right, just, right. we're trying to account for that. Actually, we, we had a, a situation somewhat like that in, in Hong Kong where you know, the, the number of cases dropped precipitously around mm -hmm. the Easter holiday when there was a four-day weekend. And you know, everyone, you know, a lot of people started thinking, wow, this is great, this is great. But of course, no testing was being done at that, at that point, or very little testing. So you know, important, I think, here too uh, in Hong Kong to remind people of the link between testing and, and, and confirmed cases. Um, now, you weren't always a medical writer. Um, I mean, when, when, I, when, I, when I met you, you were, you, were, you, were, you were a journalist, but you were doing something very different at the Wall Street Journal. Um, so how did you get into this, into this area? It was completely accidental. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what happened was, after I left Hong Kong, um, I had this grand idea of moving to Paris, living in France. <laughs> Uh, we all, we all do at some point. I, I still have that great everybody, idea. <laughs> I think everybody should do this at some point. It, it was a great dream. You know, you can live very cheaply in Paris on baguette and cheese. <laughs> uh, and I was, I was learning French and unemployed, and uh, the SARS outbreak happened. And right. I was trying to freelance and not making very much progress. And somebody I knew, an ex-editor in Hong Kong, knew somebody at WHO and, and said, you should call them. They're, they're looking for people. <laughs> Um, wow. So I got hired at WHO uh, during SARS, and I worked in the communications department. And so for me, it was a great learning experience to see what happens. I didn't had no idea what public health was, um, and it was it was a re really exciting time to be at WHO as they were uh, closing down the SARS outbreak. And, right, and I right. think it was a huge learning experience for me, um, and also being on the other side of journalists that was interesting to see. But after a few years, I did really miss a journal being a journalist. I missed being part of, 
you know, the story um, and being able to tell different stories rather than just being part of this huge organization. So I made the move back to journalism. And, and luckily, I had this health expertise. So that's how it happened. I mean, you, see, you were at the WHO at a really interesting time. It was a SARS outbreak. And I think Margaret Chan uh, of Hong Kong was the, the uh, director general at the time. Isn't that right? Well, she, when I joined, she was the director of health in Hong Kong. And okay. then a couple of years after that, That's what it was. She, okay. uh, she, joined, she joined WHO and became director general, I think, the year I left WHO, okay. actually. <laughs> okay. But, all right. In your, your time there, I mean, it's clearly you learned a lot about public health, but is it helping you now in terms of sourcing, uh, in terms of credibility with sources that you can say, hey, I've, I've been in the public health uh, arena, I know how it works. I mean, how does it help you in your current job? Um, I, I think it definitely helps because I do, I've seen how it happens on the other side. In terms of whether or not it helps me in getting, you know, better sources at WHO and elsewhere, I, I think it's debatable. Mm. Uh, I mean, I've written a few stories in recent years where WHO does not come off looking so good. <laughs> so I think there may be a reluctance among some people there to talk to me, um, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I do have some pretty good sources there, um, and and I do talk to people that I met during my years at WHO who, who maybe wouldn't talk to me otherwise. I don't know. But mm -hmm. I, I think at this point, because every reporter in the world is covering COVID, it, it doesn't matter a huge amount. I think if you're a good reporter, you can find sources that are going to talk to you. I mean, you know, I, I can't call people up and say, listen, I was at WHO. You've got to talk to me. It's, right, right. That is <laughs> it's kind of like, it do, works, do, you know who I, do you know who I am kind of thing? I used to work at the WHO. Yeah, doesn't work. It doesn't really fly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, um, um, the WHO has, has come under a lot of criticism for not being forthcoming, not being transparent. I mean, what's been your experience with them? When you, when you call them up for information, are, are they helpful? Are, are they, do they do the, go the extra mile to, to, to get information out through journalists? Are they obfuscating or are they making your life difficult? Yeah, I, I think they're they're doing a pretty good job. I mean, they do a press conference every other day in which they have the director general, the director of the emergencies program, and their technical lead on COVID-19 come out and talk to the world's press for at least an hour every other day. Um, I mean, if I have, have other queries, you know, I email their one of their spokespeople in Geneva, and they're pretty fast about getting back to me. I mean, they may not give me everything that I want, but I do think they're very responsive, and, and they are making an effort, I think, to be pretty transparent with the press and that kind of availability is, is pretty astonishing. You know, at a time when they have far more important things to do, I do think it's admirable that they are taking the time to talk to the world press every day. And I do mean the world press. I mean, the other day they started uh, simultaneous translation in all six UN languages, I believe. Wow. Um, and, and so they do make an effort to talk to journalists from countries all over the world, which is maybe not something you would see with a lot of agencies who are we're doing pressers in, you know, English or French or German. They really do give journalists from, you know, all over the world to put their questions to the top public health people. So I, you have to give them credit for that. Yeah, yeah. So, so far, you've done a lot of COVID-19 stories. I mean, what's, what's been your favorite one that you've done so far? Is there one particular story that stands out that you're, you, you, you really like or particularly proud of? I mean, I would, I would hope that that story is still in the works and <laughs> hasn't been published yet. I mean, uh, I mean, I think one story that I personally liked is um, I happened to be away. I went on, away on vacation in February at a time when it looked like it might be coming under control. And so I was gone for about 10 days with no access to email or Internet, had no idea what was coming, going on. And I came back, and that's when the outbreak in Italy and Iran had just spiked. And it was apparent that it was a pandemic. I mean, the situation clearly met WHO's own definition for a pandemic. And yet they had not declared it. So, I mean, that was the story, the first story I wrote coming back from vacation. Um, because it was, to me, it was so striking that it was spreading like wildfire, basically, in mm -hmm. these countries. And WHO had not made this declaration. Um, so that, for me, was an interesting story to write. And and what, what was like your feeling? Days. Why, in your reporting, why why did they not? Were you able to kind of pin down the reason why they seem to be late in, in announcing this? Well, I mean, I guess in their defense, you could say there's no official declaration of a pandemic as such. I mean, WHO defines it as a global 
health emergency of international concern, which they did declare at the end of January on, on the 30th, I believe. Mm -hmm. But a pandemic is what everybody thinks of when they think of, you know, a global crisis. And for them not specifically not to use that word, I think was very striking. And I think, you know, they probably did that for several reasons. Um, there was obviously tremendous pressure from various governments around the world not to make this declaration for fear of what it would do to the economy. And, and they were right in that, because as soon as they said it, I think everything changed. I yeah. mean, several days later, the UK imposed its lockdown. Um, you know, France and Germany were already heading towards that direction. And, and that's when, you know, the really severe restrictions came into place. Right, right. Uh, you know, you've you've been you've been covering this for for a while now. You you travel around. We well, used to travel around <laughs> Europe. I mean, are you concerned <laughs> about about getting the virus? Con considering that you know Boris Johnson, you're the the prime minister there, got it. I mean, it, it seems everywhere. Are, are you worried about it? Uh, I mean, yeah, it certainly wasn't reassuring when the prime minister <laughs> and many many of his leading advisors got COVID nineteen yeah. and ended up in ICU. Um, I mean, I think from the beginning, at the beginning, I really wasn't concerned because it seemed to be something that was mostly mild and, and AP was very, uh, we were very careful in every story to in, insert some boilerplate uh, graph saying that 80% of people who get this disease will only experience mild symptoms. But I think the information that we're seeing coming out more recently that, you know, people without any symptoms, asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic could pass it on. Yeah, I mean, I think about it when I'm at the grocery store and somebody's a little bit too close to me. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, from a personal point of view, I would hope that uh, if I got it, that I wouldn't get a severe version. I mean, I don't have any underlying conditions as far as I know. Um, and, and I'm trying to follow all the government's recommendations in terms of, you know, not going to crowded places and getting in and out of stores <laughs> as quickly as I can. So, so but, what yeah, kind of I, I think you can't dismiss it entirely yeah what kind of precautions do you take when you go outside uh, and, and what do you what do you see people in in, in London do if, if they when they do go outside I mean are, are people wearing masks or are people taking protective measures I mean I think some people are wearing masks um, I personally still am not I mean the evidence on that um, is quite mixed okay um, so personally I don't feel the need to wear masks. Um, like I said, I'm not going to try to spend any more time in an enclosed space like a store than I absolutely have to. Um, and I think um, from the evidence that the scientists have gathered so far, there's no evidence of any single transmission happening outside. So mm. all the transmission that we know of has been inside. So mostly when I'm outside, you know, I'm going to the parks or something like that. And, and I think people in London are very conscious of this now. I mean, we've been under lockdown for more than a month now. So, I mean, it's interesting. You'll, you know, see somebody coming towards you on the sidewalk and, mm -hmm. you know, either I or they will cross the street. <laughs> or make, honestly, and, and maybe in the past I would have taken that personally, but right. now I just think, thank you for being yeah, so exactly. awful. So well, it's, it's I, I think everybody's trying to give each other a really wide berth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we see, we see that here in Hong Kong, but you know, here in Hong Kong, everybody—I mean, everybody—is <laughs> wearing masks on on the street. Uh, and you know, I, I think in in some ways, it's it's a show of solidarity for the for the for the people here. Uh, you know, it, it's possibly tied to you know the, the recent government attempt to ban wearing a face mask due to the protests. Um, but it, it is impressive here, uh, you know, and I, I think, you know, for us in Hong Kong, it's, it's not just a public health issue. It's, it's a way to show that, you know, we're, we're all in this together and um, we all respect each other. And I, I kind of I get that feeling. I don't know if it's true or not, but that's kind of the feeling I get when, when I'm on the street, you know, dutifully wearing, wearing my mask. So, um, you know, maybe there, maybe there are social and psychological issues uh, for that as well. I'm sure there are. I mean, I would say maybe somewhere like 30 to 50 percent of people in London are wearing masks. Um, definitely not the majority. Wow. Um, and like I said, I just am not personally convinced of the evidence. <laughs> and I don't have any masks. So, so you're, <laughs> I'll, I'll, send, I'll send you some. They would be hard to get. That, that's another issue. That's, you know, no, that's even true. Even if we wanted to get them in London, I don't think you would be able to. I think you'd have to make your own. Yeah. So. Well, I, I will um, send you some masks right, 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 right this afternoon. How about that? Yeah. Send it well, with a champagne. 
<laughs> exactly. And I, I'll, I'll try to send different color masks so you can match your wardrobe as well, because that, that's important. I would yeah. I would appreciate that. That'd be very thoughtful. Thank you. Well, Maria, thank you very much for your time. Please stick around. We're going to take some questions for students. But uh, I wanted to say you know, thank you so much for, for, for sharing uh, all your experience uh, with us. Uh, it's, it's a great pleasure. And I cannot wait to um, share this bottle of, of, of champagne with you, hopefully in, in, the, in the next few months. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for having me. It was, uh, it was really fun. And um, I hope we can crack that bottle open soon. Definitely. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Maria, you take care. Stay safe. Stay healthy.